Welcome to this episode of Real Chemistry, where we're going to talk about calculus-based heat capacity. So in the past, you might have done heat capacity problems, and you didn't have to do any calculus. Why do we have to do calculus now? Well, that's what we're going to spend the first part of the video talking about. Why is it that we need calculus to solve these problems when you've been doing them for a while without calculus? And then we're going to actually solve a problem where we'll use calculus to calculate a heat capacity. So first, what's heat capacity? Remember, it's a measure of how much temperature will increase as we add heat energy. If you want to check out a bunch of other videos on heat capacity, check the links below in the description. Okay, so let's think about how a system gains energy. How is it that when we heat a, bo a box of molecules, wh what happens to them? In what ways do they gain energy? Well, there's four ways, principally, that they can gain energy. They can gain electronic energy. That is, you can excite an electron from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. They can gain vibrational energy. That is, the molecules can start vibrating faster. They can gain rotational energy. That is, the molecules can start rotating more. And lastly, translational energy. That is, they can start moving faster. That is, they can have a higher velocity. And these different ways of absorbing heat occur at different temperatures. So notice that Translational energies, the gaps between each of these levels, right? These are quantized if we think about quantum mechanics. The gaps between each of those levels is like 10 to the minus 40th joules. So that's a really, really small energy gap. So basically whenever there's any appreciable temperature, something can gain translational energy. But rotational energy, those gaps are higher in energy, 10 to the minus 23 joules. And that means the temperature has to be higher before you can give in a single collision enough energy to excite a molecule rotationally. And then vibrational, higher energies, and electronic, final, finally, even higher energies. So, as temperature increases, the different ways our molecule can accept energies changes. Because just like in spectroscopy, where we saw that an, a, a molecule could only change an energy level if the energy of the photon matched the gap, in heat capacity, our molecule can only change energy levels if the energy of our collision between other molecules, right, that's transferring heat, is equal to those energy gaps. So, these become more and more relevant as T increases. So at the lowest T's, we only need to worry about translational. At slightly higher T's, rotational, higher T's, vibrational, and extremely high temperatures, electronic. The electronic usually not relevant uh, for a way that, um, that uh, a molecule can absorb energy from heat. Okay, so there's different ways of absorbing heat, and those occur at different temperatures. What does that mean for our calc-based heat capacity? Well, what that means is if we look at a plot of our heat capacity, it's not constant over time, right? This is a plot of heat capacity, in this case a constant volume, as a function of temperature. Notice it starts out at 3 halves. The units here, if you're curious, are actually in terms of R. So this is 7 halves R, that's the gas constant, 5 half R, and 3 halves R. And that's a common way to report heat capacities, uh, is in terms of multiples of the uh, gas constant. And so when we start out at low temperatures, it's about 3 halves R, and then it rises at higher temperatures. Once rotational motion becomes relevant, our heat capacity then increases because that's another way to store energy. So as we apply energy to our molecule, now we can heat it in a bunch of different ways. And the more different ways there are to heat to, uh, for a molecule to absorb energy, the more energy it takes to increase its temperature. It's basically making the bucket bigger that we're filling with heat because now it can be excited in a bunch of different ways. And then eventually we'll get to the point where we can fill up the vibrational energy levels and the electronic ones aren't even shown in this graph. This, by the way, is a very idealized picture of our heat capacity over temperature, and is particularly relevant for ideal gases. Real gases have all sorts of complex relationships between temperature and heat capacity. And so if we actually want to look at our heat capacity, we can't just treat it as one number. We have to actually realize that our heat capacity is a function of temperature. And that's why we need calculus. Let's take a look at our two equations we might know. This guy up top is the equation you might have used before to do heat capacity. And this assumes a constant molar heat capacity, Cm. So if your heat capacity doesn't change, you can use this equation. This is the more general equation for heat capacity, which tells us, oh, guess what? Your heat capacity is often a function of temperature, as we just saw. And that means that you can't just treat it as one exact number. If you do, you're making an approximation. So this top equation is decent, if our heat capacity is constant over the temperature range we're interested in. In other words, if I'm looking right here, I can use the top equation. 
Because look, our, our heat capacity doesn't change much. It stays at three halves. On the other hand, if I'm looking at this region where it's changing a lot, I definitely need to use this guy because there our heat capacity is most certainly changing and a function of temperature. In general, the bottom equation is always going to give you the right answer. That's the more general correct equation. Let's take a look at a problem that uses calculus to solve heat capacity. So this problem says the molar heat capacity of naphthalene, that's two benzene rings fused together, at constant pressure and the units of joules per mole per kelvin is given by uh, CPM is equal to negative 6.16 plus 1.03 T over K. A couple notes here. This over K thing is just to get the units right. Really, we're just multiplying by T. So you could write that without the K. The point of the K being there is just to remind you, hey, uh, we're dividing by units of Kelvin there to make our um, CPM have the correct units, ultimately joules per mole per Kelvin. Another thing you'll notice is this has an approximate equal sign here. There's other terms here that have dropped. So the next one will be like minus some number times T squared and then plus some number times T cubed and so forth. And we've truncated that. If you want to be more accurate, you need to include more terms. So the more terms you include, the more accurate it is. And if you look in the back of most um, thermodynamics textbooks, you'll see heat capacities listed for some substances, and they'll have a whole series of constants you can do. So we're just going to use the first two for computational simplicity, but there's no real difference when you do the math. It just takes a little longer if you have more terms. All right, the question now asks, in this bottom part, how much heat must be absorbed by naphthalene to warm 3.7 moles from 285K to 345K? So we're going to go ahead and do that problem, and we're going to use our calculus equation. What does that look like? Well, I'm going to plug in our variables. So N is just moles, right, just like in the ideal gas law. And then we're going to integrate from T initial, that's 285, to T final, that's 345. And those are in Kelvin. And then what we're going to do is we're going to plug in our CPM. Notice that this is our molar heat capacity. And it actually doesn't matter if it's CP or CV, this equation will work. Um, and so what I'm going to plug in there is negative 6.16 and then plus 1.03. And I'm just going to put T there. I'm going to drop that Kelvin thing. Remember, that's just reminding us that we're going to divide by Kelvin to get our units right but it doesn't actually affect, affect the math you're going to do down here. All right, so that's a pretty easy integral, and you'll find that all of these heat capacity equations are easy integrals. They're all polynomials. And so let's go ahead and evaluate that integral. So we're going to get Q equals 3.7, and then parentheses. Our minus 1.6, or 6.16, I'm sorry, just gains a T. So that guy just gains a T, minus 6.16 T. And then this guy, right, it's 1.03t, so it becomes 1.03t squared over 2. And what we're going to do then is evaluate this guy from 285 to 345. And then we're going to multiply that all by 3.7, that's our moles. All right, let's go ahead and do that. So Q is equal to... 3.7, and then I'm going to use a brackets here. Here's basically the hardest part of these problems. The integration is not that hard, but it's easy to screw up your signs here. So pay careful attention, right? First, we're going to plug in the top number, 6.16 times our top number, 345. And then we're going to add to that 1.03 over 2. And this guy's squared, 345 squared. All right, that's our top bound. Now we're going to subtract from that, evaluating at our bottom bound, 6.16, not 6, 6.16 times 285, and that's negative, plus 1.03 over 2, and now our t squared, 285 squared. So that's the correct set of math plugged in. But it might take you a few tries plugging that in to make sure you get the right answer. So plug this into your calculator a few times. What you should get is about 70,000 joules. Seventy thousand joules. And so what we get is Q is equal to seventy thousand joules or seventy kilojoules. Both of those numbers are sig fig, so I'll just add a little decimal there. So that's our Q. 
So you can see what we've done here is just taken into account the fact that heat capacity is changing with temperature. And that means that to calculate heat capacity, we really have to do this integral. More complicated problems will have a few more terms in terms of T, which will make your math more annoying, but no harder. So this is calculus-based heat capacity. Fundamentally, what we're doing is reflecting on the fact that how much our temperature rises when you add heat depends on what temperature our system is at. And that means we have to plug in our heat capacity as a function of T. Now, sometimes you'll have a heat capacity that's basically constant. If you're dealing with liquid water over narrow ranges, it stays pretty much the same. And that means you can use your original equation that you've already learned. So you need to pay attention to what your problem tells you. If your problem tells you, hey, treat this like a constant heat capacity, you can use that simpler equation and skip the integral. However, if it gives you a heat capacity in terms of a function of T, you have to go ahead and use calculus. So thanks for watching this episode of Real Chemistry. If you have any questions, please ask them below. As always, subscribe to receive updates of future videos.